Is that recording? Oh yeah, okay. So hi everyone and welcome to our March session of reproducibility and we're delighted to see so many of you join today and we're very happy to welcome Dr. Roz Attenborough, uh, who's a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Science, Technology and Innovation Studies at the University of Edinburgh. And today, Roz is going to talk about her PhD re research, as well as some other work. Um, and this work explored the meaning of openness in science. And she's going to tell us about this work today in her talk, which is entitled Stories from the Open Science Revolution, How Scientists Talk About Openness. So I'll hand it over to to you Roz and thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, thank you so much Neve and, and thank you Laura. I'm really excited to speak at this uh, reproducibility session. Um, it's kind of an opportunity to connect with um, communities and parts of the university and maybe people outside the University of Edinburgh too uh, who are interested in this topic. Uh, I've, I've kind of got really interested in openness in science from maybe an angle that's a bit different to the normal and ended up doing a PhD on it from uh, a social studies of science perspective, which I fin and I finished it just in December, so it's very fresh to me still. Uh, and I hope there'll be something of interest uh, to, to everyone here. I, I hope that if you're a researcher, maybe especially if you're a biological scientist, this talk will uh, come up, uh, sort of have some familiar feelings come up for you, or, or maybe not, and I'm really interested to hear your feedback later on. Uh, so here we go. Uh, to give you an impression of where I'm coming from, so I originally trained in biology and I had some opportunities to do research. Uh, I looked at coral nervous systems, it was brilliant, I really enjoyed it. Uh, but I, at that time I also got quite interested in social and cultural aspects of science, you know, um, the, you know, why is it so important to publish in certain ways um, and, and other little observations that I made. And through that I ended up going to work in publishing to sort of see how the cogs turn behind these kinds of things. And I was very fortunate to end up working in open access publishing at the journal PLOS Genetics, which I did for three years. And that was really great. Uh, but that was also my introduction to open science movements. And those also really interested me. And I ended up eventually sort of formally going to retrain in social studies of science. And that's what I've been doing since then. So I've been studying openness in science uh, for, a for a master's degree and for my PhD, which I just finished. And I've just sort of popped the title down there, uh, Finding Virtue in Open Science, Biological Scientists, Constructions of Openness in Historical Advocacy and Policy Context. So that's, that's the kind of boring version of it. Um, I'm more than happy to sort of share information about that with anyone or discuss it if you're interested. Um, the way I usually introduce the topic is by talking about six reasons why I studied openness in science, why I sort of found ended up finding it fascinating in a very broad way. So I'll just run through those uh, relatively briefly with you now. Um, so the first reason is fairly obvious to this group. I think it's um, open science or open research is increasingly salient in research policy and publish publishing in university contexts, especially over the last 20 years or so. So I won't go through this, but this is just a sort of snapshot of particularly important policy level developments uh, in the U UK sort of European context uh, over the last sort of 10, 15 years. Uh, the second reason is there these grand promises associated with open science, so this revolutionary promise. There, it's not small changes that are being proposed. You get statements like, the internet may pave the way for a second open science revolution as great as that triggered by the creation of the first scientific journals. So it's a sort of a rebirth of science that's often being imagined in, in narratives of open science. Uh, the third reason, which I looked at in my thesis, but I won't go into much depth here, is that I, I looked at this sort of the old and new sides of open science. So how often there's this idea that, uh, you know, open science is very new in the last 20 years, but also in some way, openness is essential to science or is a very traditional thing in science. So I, I kind of analysed that. Uh, the fourth reason, sort of quite interesting from a social perspective to me, is uh, open science is quite hard to pin down. You can try to define it and many people have and there are good definitions, but you get this sort of nebulousness like open science is an umbrella term encompassing a multitude of assumptions about the future of knowledge creation and dissemination or 
Open science is the movement to make scientific research, data and dissemination accessible to all levels of an inquiring society. So these uh, definitions need to be very expansive in order to include the way that open science is expanding. And that umbrella metaphor is very common to try and capture this sort of expansiveness, all the things that go under the umbrella. And I think everyone in this group will be familiar with how the umbrella grows, you know, the things um, in this diagram of by no means the only things um, that are part of open science now. Uh, the fifth reason, uh, which was kind of one of the theoretical aspects of my PhD, was I, I looked at um, whether ideas of open science have kind of been redefined, like uh, the way open science is being spoken about in, in policy and by scientists, was it being framed as a sort of the new default good way of doing science? For example, could you compare it to objectivity, which also has an interesting history where it sort of arose at a certain period in time? And I, I explored that using a concept called epistemic virtue. Uh, I won't go much into that, but I'm happy to discuss that. <clears throat> um, and what I want to focus on in this talk really is my sixth reason, which is the kind of practical and human reason why I studied, studied this area, which is there seems to be a kind of gap in understanding between many scientists and the sort of policy and advocacy people and perhaps people in this group who would like to see open science take hold in a bigger way. So, as I say, open science movements are often led by scientists, but many scientists are also perceived to be ambivalent or slow adopters or researchers generally. Um, of these kinds of ideas and associated with this policy and advocacy discourse turns towards a need for cultural change and so this idea of culture is quite interesting you get statements like um, from the league of european research universities you get uh, there are real dangers in trying to introduce new practices without carrying the academic community with the leaders of those changes uh, in many ways cultural change is the most difficult outcome to achieve in embracing open science um, but uh, Cameron Nalen, an, an open science advocate and scholar, says there's a consistent theme, this desire for cultural change, especially from a policy perspective, but there's not necessarily engagement with the concept of culture. So I like to think that what I can partially do is, is engage with that concept of culture in relation to openness in my work. Uh, so in a brief introduction to the PhD project itself, this it, this was my kind of central general question. How is the meaning of open in science being constructed? And I was asking that question mainly of biological scientists and somewhat also of policy, open science policy makers and advocates, um, and mainly via in-depth qualitative interviews, but also somewhat via documents. I did 54 interviews, 40 with scientists and 40, 14 with the policy makers and advocates which is a decent number of interviews for, for in-depth qualitative study. Um, and I attempted to include kind of varied career stages, uh, genders, biological disciplines, most were in the UK, some were in Australia. And also a key thing is I tried to include people who had varied relationships with open science movements. So some people very enthusiastic, some people without any specific relationship to these movements. And just a couple of notes that this is a deliberately broad topic because it was attempting to sort of uh, be able to examine this this broad expansiveness that uh, that open science has and what I was attempting to do is explore these meanings that exist uh, for, pe for people and, and that are being constructed in documents not saying how open science should be defined which is also is also valuable work that other people do okay <clears throat> and this is the this is one of the central questions in my interviews. I asked what first comes to mind when you think about openness in science? And I was asking this type of question because I thought, I don't necessarily know where other people are at here. So I don't know, will the things under the um, open science umbrella come up? So will it be open access? Will that be the first thing that comes up? Open data, open notebooks, pre-registration, citizen science, it could be any of these things. Will it be something that I didn't expect at all? So I'll just give you a brief indication of the kinds of findings. Uh, so this is by no means complete, and I don't expect you to take this all in, uh, but, but people came up, this is biological scientists, with a, like, quite a range of different things, um, both expected and unexpected. And 
the things I'm going to focus on are just the things above the line here that, that more than half of people mention themselves without me bringing it up. Um, so and I, these became three kind of findings chapters of my thesis. So one was about open access, another about um, open data, open research data. So that's both quite expected. And the third big one was about interpersonal openness, which was less expected, although in some ways quite obvious. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. So I think my slide is out of order there. Yeah, OK, so I'll talk about open access first, um, just briefly. So the things that characterise open access here. So just as a reminder, I wasn't doing a kind of attitude survey towards these different categories. I was looking at how people spoke about them when they came up spontaneously um, and, and the sort of ways they were framed and the sort of tones of the, the way people spoke around it and what they associated it with. So um, with open access, there was a there was a high kind of acceptance around it. People like thought it was a very good idea in principle. And, and people were generally quite happy to do it. Um, but interestingly, those attitudes were quite conditional. So although although there was this acceptance when people spoke about open access, it was often framed in terms of different types of problems. And the, the biggest sort of problem type framing was around money and finances. So open access was basically just seen as something that costs money by a lot of people and is expensive, sort of prohibitively expensive compared to other sort of lab costs. Um, uh, associated with that also was a sort of gold centred journal, journal centred view of open access uh, as opposed to a kind of green repository view. So um, and that that was seen as costing money, even though it doesn't always and those two things were kind of linked. So even though uh, as a repository view of open access is quite prominent in some policies, it wasn't prominent in the way scientists spoke about it. Um, and this money view also associated open access with a sense of kind of scepticism around how money flows, especially associated with big publishers, um, and a sense of scarcity about money in science, and also a sense of distrust of the kinds of institutions that that are responsible for these things. Um, another prominent framing was a compliance framing. So uh, the sense is this is especially in a UK context where there is uh, there's quite a lot of machinery in place and administration and work and labour to get open access to happen. And the policies are there to, to ask people to do it. Um, so it was seen in, in a way as not something where you particularly needed to have an opinion. It just was something that either was done for you because you have um, you have a lot of help at your university or something that was a bit of a bureaucratic nightmare for similar reasons. So it really depended on your experience of bureaucracy. Um, so that's, that's why I included this quote here. Um, this is from a, a sort of within university open access advocacy uh, perspective. So one of my interviewees said, if all of the open access policies went away tomorrow, we probably would only have incrementally increased engagement. The voluntary engagement before this was around the 10, 10 to 15% of material was being made open access. And, and she sort of doubted if it would be much higher if those policies went away. And she described research attitude as reluctance. So of course, this is only one point of view, but it was sort of interesting, the sense that people were complying, reasonably happy to comply, but not sort of highly driven to comply. Uh, now move on to open data. So this was a very, very different situation. Uh, extremely varied kinds of attitudes and relationships with open data uh, were shown. Um, there were, they sort of could be broadly put into three groups. So one of them, there was this kind of acceptance and familiarity, which was sort of a little bit similar to the open access situation. And I, I think that this was associated with fields in which um, there were longer standing traditions of data sharing and kind of standardised formats and expectations for doing it. So genomics and crystallography are two of those fields. Um, then there were two other sort of radically opposed categories. There were, some people were kind of embracing the idea with passion and principle. And there were also a few, a smaller group of people who viewed it very cautiously and defensively. And I think both of these sort of more polarised views are associated with recent open open science movements. And when I say open data, this, this sort of extends a bit into opening up methods and that kind of thing. Um, 
Um, and one thing I did in my analysis is I ended up linking open data and some other concepts of openness um, with vulnerability. Um, so a suggestion that some of these types of openness feel like a vulnerability or are a vulnerability. Um, and this is mainly due to competitive pressures or simply that openness is an exposure of process. Um, and I'm now going to just go through some interview quotes that indicate a sense of what I mean by vulnerability and the sort of more defensive responses and why these might come about. So um, this is one reaction to, um, uh, so I didn't ask about open data, this came up spontaneously after the, quest, after the question of um, what do you think about associated with openness in science? So Ernie said, there's this new thing coming along where pe wanting people to make all their data open. But that's in my opinion, particularly groups of people who have an ax to grind and don't think about, don't really think about what, how what they're arguing for impacts other people. Um, and to give an, more of an impression of what Ernie means and what lies behind that, he, he also said this about ideas. So he said, what I own and nobody else can have are my ideas. They come from inside my head. I generate them through the happiness and misery of my life. That's where the ideas come from. When I graduated university, I was going to be an artist. I wasn't going to be a scientist. But I found that the process of designing beautiful experiments actually satisfied the same creative urge in me. But I do sort of have a, an artist's view of ideas, that ideas are really critical and they're unique and they come from your soul and other people don't own them. So I don't see why in a non totalitarian, well, not even in a totalitarian society, you just can't make people share ideas. So this, this is an unusual quote and I'm including it partly because it's, it's um, really interesting um, and in a way nicely put, but um, the interesting thing here is that this is what he associates with making all your data open. He's talking about ideas. It, he, he jumps straight to the, to the notion that you would be asked to share everything that's in your head. Um, and that that's sort of a kind of vulnerability that I'm talking about. So this is this is the vulnerability of sort of being seen inside yourself and having your sort of your mental and your creative resources being drawn upon. Um, but interestingly, later in the interview, when I asked any about more specific ideas of sharing data, he said, I don't have any problem with giving people access to the raw data but I think people should have, have access to the stuff that you know that's associated specifically with the publication. So several things were interesting things were going on there. Um, his initial reaction was stronger uh, than his actual kind of acceptance of these ideas around open data. What he initially spoke of was closer to open notebook science and it was more associated with sharing ideas. But it, this tells you something about the kind of the, the emotional reactions and the very real sense of vulnerability that some people have around this. Um, and to give you a very different perspective, um, so Luke, an early, early career researcher, told me um, he was very extremely into open science. So if I publish a paper, I put all my data sets, all my R scripts, I put everything into it so that it's completely open. But he, he said right, right up, which makes you feel very vulnerable. Like when I publish a paper, I'm terrified I'm going to get an email within like a month with someone saying you've done this all wrong and you need to retract the paper. It is scary and it's like sometimes when I'm falling asleep, I'm, asleep, I'm like, oh shit, what happens if someone finds a huge mistake? So this is an interesting example. And Luke's comments sort of helped me come up with this um, idea of vulnerability linking openness because he kind of felt this vulnerability, but um, he worked through it um, as part of his openness. So he was so committed to the idea of openness being good science, basically, that he was willing to do this labor or even um, doing this labor was sort of part of what he wanted to do with his science. Um, and just to give another example, so Melanie, a senior, senior ecologist said, um, so the first data set I collected was a big one as a PhD student. And I worked so hard, hard on those, like multiple years out every weekend. And when, then when I published the first paper in that series, they were like, you have to publish the data. And I thought, you know, she'd been planning all these other papers with that data and they just hadn't talked about it openly in the lab. And she said, I wasn't ready for it right. 
I didn't know. And so I completely freaked out and I thought I didn't want someone else to take the data and analyze it in those ways. So this is sort of interesting. The same themes come up again. Um, but what's kind of notable is that she she was worried about competition. She was wanting to protect her data from this kind of competitive, uh, maybe imagined competitive forces. But um, it was really linked to the fact that she put so much work, so much labor, and also her kind of emotional identity into this data. Um, and I just, yeah, I included this one as well to indicate a kind of broader atmosphere around um, the consequences of opening up or not opening up in, in today's sort of online environments. Um, so Lara was talking about um, particular open science advocate who calls himself a data thug, goes into other people's data and looks for mistakes. And she says, this is good, right? You should look for mistakes. And that's a good side of um, making your data available openly. But I don't think it's right to call to call people out and to publicly shame them. So this this is this idea of sort of vulnerability and shame, both being potential consequences of openness that's sort of coming out here. Um, so what I did in the thesis was I looked at things like this in people's accounts and I kind of I made a table of the different types of uh, points in time at which there are vulnerability, which types of vulnerability there are. Um, and I, I made, yes, yeah, so I'll show you a bit here. The, the short term factors can be to do with timing and the extent of sharing. So um, if you if you share something later on, it's less vulnerable, potentially. In the medium term, you might have vulnerabilities related to resourcing. Um, so these are resourcing of your current project compared to other ones in a similar area. Um, or they might be to do with the labor and care associated with your data set. Um, then in the long term, you can get quite deep seated types of vulnerability related to your community and identity. So things like um, the competitiveness you feel in your community, but also over the long term, how has that affected the trust that you have in your community? Um, and I also found that social support and mentorship and reputation, uh, sorry, social support and mentorship especially the, the support you get early in your career seems to be quite influential over the long term. So Melanie, for example, spoke about it not having been something that was discussed in the lab. Um, and Luke also, although I didn't include it in the quote, mentioned that he felt incredibly supported by his community um, in doing these these open practices. So for, so for him, you know, there's a bit of a cushion if if that vulnerability turns out you know, to go a bit wrong for him. He knows that people won't say that uh, he was wrong to do it. Um, and there are also obviously, um, if you have particular security from your the, the point you are at in your career or your reputation, then uh, you won't be as vulnerable to these things and maybe you'll be more free to be open. So uh, I'm just pointing you here to the fact that I made this table of these sort of higher and lower control um, factors for um, how how vulnerable you might find openness. Um, I won't expect you to take these in, but I'm happy to kind of share these things later if you like. Um, and here I just want to, again, don't expect you to take it in, but I just want to point you to the fact that I have tried uh, to suggest how these these kind of factors might feed overall into how willing people are to accept uh, sort of open data practices or related open practices or whether they're likely to resist them. So <clears throat> I'm kind of suggesting here that these factors I've just been talking about might shape your overall sort of position, um, whether, whether you feel more likely to accept or resist data openness, but other factors are involved as well. So for instance, if there are certain like technical ways of making open data easier, it might sort of slightly increase your um, willingness to be open, but it might not fundamentally change what your overall kind of vulnerability is in that situation. But I also suggested up the top here that, for example, if you really believe that openness is um, part of good science and it defines your identity um, as a scientist, then you might be able to overcome 
like a quite high degree of vulnerability in this case. So this this is just a suggestion for how things could work, and I'm kind of interested in um, chatting it over with people and sharing it, um, if that is of interest. <clears throat> so uh, finally, I just want to turn towards interpersonal openness. This is the third main category that was mentioned often by scientists without me kind of suggesting it to them in advance. And the interesting thing about it was that it isn't, it isn't really a sort of pre-named category. I've just called it interpersonal openness because it came up repeatedly. So I needed for a, a name to refer to it by. And you, you might all be quite familiar with what I'm talking about, um, but it's not just uh, scientists talking to each other. So what Adam said, for example, was um, in response to the question, what do you think about when you think about openness in science? He said, I think about the many scientists I have known and the way they approach how they communicate their work and when they communicate it and how communicative they are and what sort of discussions you can have with them. That's what I think about. And he goes on to say, you see huge variation in that. You see schools of thought where you don't tell anybody anything until you've published it. You don't give talks in public. You don't discuss it with other scientists. You go so far as instructing your students and people not to discuss it elsewhere. Um, and then there are people at the opposite extreme who will talk about everything. So the way I kind of conceptualized interpersonal openness was, um, so it's an understanding of openness that's outside traditional open science advocacy and policy. Um, although please, please feel free to tell me if you think it's not. Um, it's often spoken about as talking freely about unpublished ideas, a, a domain in which trust and reciprocity is really important. So it's, it, can, it occurs in trusting sort of conversations and it can be a pathway to collaboration. Um, and I found that there were a real, there's a full spectrum of attitudes and approaches towards this. And again, it was just like open data or open methods, it was linked to vulnerability. So people were sort of holding back a bit where they felt they, their information or themselves were vulnerable um, and sort of uh, giving, giving more when they felt more in control. Um, so what I want to suggest here is that although this is not the kind of online openness that a lot of people who are keen on open science would like to see, I do think that the ways that this particular behaviour plays out in scientific communities is an important underlying feature of research cultures that is linked with how people can be on um, open online as well. So again, just an indication here, but I made a kind of spectrum from interpersonal openness to interpersonal closure to indicate um, that, that scientists, researchers occupy the full range of positions on this spectrum from people who have made a policy that generosity pays and it, they do it by rule and they've decided that that will benefit their lab and it's also the right thing to do. <clears throat> and on the other end of the spectrum, you get people who, for whom it's not even that they don't even really relate to the idea. It's sort of just normal to protect your ideas, normal and kind of essential a matter of survival. Um, and I just, one interesting thing about interpersonal openness to me is that it potentially gets obscured in discussions about um, open science that occur in this sort of online advocacy context. Because for example, this is the response of someone who, who is an open science advocate when I asked what comes to mind when you think about openness in science? And he said, what comes to mind is the complexity of implementation. The most important issues are no longer about getting consensus on what the aim is. It's about making it work in practice. So that response is interesting because it jumps straight to um, like an assumed concept of what open science is about um, and why it's important. Um, whereas kind of, I guess, at the opposite end of the spectrum, this, this is someone who didn't really relate to the concept of openness initially at all. So I, she said, openness, actually, I don't really know what you mean by openness in science. And I, and I said, sort of, no, don't worry, I'm not trying to give it a secret underlying meaning. Um, just, you know, um, say, say what you feel about it. Say, say it doesn't mean anything to you if, if that's what it is. And she said, she went a lot, sort of, she expanded by saying, I guess having worked in the traditional circumstances of competitive labs, 
where you are, I guess it's not really secretive, but protective your, of your ideas, at least until you get them published. To me, that's normal. So I don't see that as not being open. And one of the things that's happening there is implicitly she's talking about interpersonal openness. She's not, not talking about online openness at all in, in that statement. But also the, the position she's at is so far, so far from what Thomas was talking about in the previous. And I think this understanding the way people relate in this kind of context tells you something about research culture that's kind of a step before or, or underlying what might lead to openness online. So there's that spectrum again. So, uh, sorry, I've thrown quite a bit of data at you, um, and I hope I hope it's making a bit of sense. Um, I just want to finish up by mentioning where I'm at now. Um, so I'm thinking about now what are the lessons for policy, and what are the lessons for research communities out of this, if any. You know, can I offer anything useful from this in a practical way? And I'm quite interested now in working with other people and learning from other people and kind of bringing this research back into contact with, you know, so-called reality. Um, and what I'd really like to do is um, take some actions to promote healthy research cultures, kind of from the bottom up, like that support or underlie openness and collaboration, perhaps using this concept of interpersonal openness. And what I'm doing right now is I'm, I have a six month postdoctoral fellowship at the moment where it's fairly flexible and I have some opportunities to kind of chat and collaborate around this topic. And at the moment, I'm also just about to apply for a one year postdoctoral fellowship, which I would use kind of for practical purposes, potentially trying to help build communities and capacity across the University of Edinburgh. But first, I'm going to find out what everyone else thinks and, and how they're interested in this topic. So bottom line is please feel free to get in touch um, and thank you so much for listening and, and thank you for everyone else who's made this possible as well. Maybe I'll leave it on that slide for now. Great, I'll just um, turn off the recording now before we start our discussion section, but that was fantastic Roz, thanks very much.